The Golden Bread Once upon a time, in a tiny village, there lived a woman named Mary, with her only daughter, Rossi. Mary was extremely humble and sweet. Rossi, however, was completely the opposite. She was beautiful beyond words. She loved herself a lot. Rossi, would you help me plant the seeds? Why would I do that? What if my fingers get dirty? What if it got onto my face? Well, that was the problem with Rossi. She had many marriage proposals, but she rejected them all. Why did you send those men away yesterday? You can't be serious, Mom. One of them had such small eyes, almost like a bird. And the other had a huge nose. I wouldn't want to be near him when he sneezed. Oh, and the last? Stop. No, my dear, you must know that beauty isn't everything. Mother, I deserve someone like a prince or a knight. One night, when she was sleeping, her mother was watching her. At that moment, Rossi smiled in her sleep. Her mother was extremely surprised. How nice. She must be having a really funny dream. The next morning, Rossi woke up with all smiles and giggles. Dear, tell me, what did you dream of last night? Well, Mom, do you know there was this prince who wanted to marry me? He had to come in a golden carriage, and he was dressed gold from top to bottom. What a silly dream. It was a very strange dream. Mom, and there was bread made of gold. The mother was worried about her daughter. One day, two of her friends, Belly and John, came to visit Mary. They had a secret. They were magical beings. Mary knew nothing about it. Oh, John, oh, Belly, it's been a very long time since I saw you both. How are you? I'd be better if my daughter Rossi was a little more understanding. Mary told Belly and John all about Rossi and how she was worried for her. She wants to eat bread made of gold. What do I do with her? Well, maybe if her dream comes true, hum, that would be wonderful, wouldn't it? Well, no matter. I guess in time she will grow to learn. Let's talk about something else now. Later on, Belly and John went away, smiling to each other secretly. That night, both mother and daughter got ready for bed. Mother, I hope my dream comes true, you know. Oh, Rossi. The next day, as Rossi and her mother were in the garden, a beautiful golden carriage came riding up to them. It was studded in gems and diamonds and looked beautiful. As it stopped, a handsome man came out of it and looked at Rossi. She was completely in love with this handsome man. Mom! Mom! My dream is coming true! Um, what? Hello. I've come here to ask for Rossi's hand in marriage. But how do you know her name? And who are you? I am Johnson the angel of good fortune. Your daughter's name and beauty are known throughout the world. Oh my, I would love to marry you. What? But you hardly know him. You can't go with him. Oh, how silly. He's rich and handsome. What more could I want? Johnson, I accept your proposal. And with that, she got into his carriage and without even saying goodbye to her mother, rode off with the angel. As they were traveling, the carriage suddenly entered a magical portal. There, it traveled through a stormy sea. The carriage bumped, and Rossi got scared. Don't worry, my dear. All of this will soon be over. Just as he said this, the carriage went through another portal and reached the driveway of a huge and magnificent golden castle. Rossi was amazed at all the beauty she saw. I knew I deserved so much riches. I knew you'd like it. Anything you want, you will find here. From the prettiest of dresses to the tastiest of foods. All of it in my palace. 
Well, speaking of food, I'm really hungry after that ride. I'm starving. Can I have any of that tasty food? Yes, of course. Here, meet Belissa. She will get you whatever you want. Hi, Rossi. I've heard so much about you. Are you hungry? Come, I'll get you some food. Oh, thank you. They went into the dining room, and there on the table was the most astounding food Rossi had ever seen. The food looks amazing. The golden bread, how lovely. This jam will look and taste lovely with the bread. She took a slice with the ruby jam on it and took a huge bite. This is hard. I can't eat this. Well, it's bread made of gold. But if can't eat it, should I get you silver bread instead? But I want normal bread. The bread which I can eat at home. Don't you have that? Nope. You have to eat gold. Rossi looked at the food, but was heartbroken. For everything there was incredible. She soon started to cry. Oh, let me go. I don't want this. But the food is really good. Here, I'll try some golden potatoes. They're really good. And afterward, you shall be married to me. And you'll have to eat all of this. No, I don't want to marry you. I want to go home to my mother. Let me go home. Belisa and Johnson looked at each other and winked. Well, if that's really what you want, then I suppose I shall take you home. Johnson took Rossi home. In the carriage, she started to think deeply about the choices she had made. When she reached home, she ran to hug her mother. Mom! Mom, I'm back! Rossi? Oh, I thought I'd never see you again. Oh, Mom, I love you so much, and you were right! She told everything to her mother about what had happened. I'm so sorry for the way I acted, Mom. Oh, dear, it's all right. You knew all your mistakes. Come, let's have food. From that day, Rossi changed her ways. And slowly, she started to become a lot nicer. The End The Wise Maiden Once upon a time, in Russia, there were two brothers. One was rich, named Dmitri, and the other one was poor, named Ivan. Both set off for the market. The rich man rode a stallion, and the poor brother, a young mare. At dusk, they stopped beside an empty hut and tied their horses outside before going to sleep. The next morning... They were surprised when they saw three horses outside. Well, to be exact, the newcomer was not a horse. It was a foal, to which the mare had given birth during the night. When the two brothers set eyes on it for the first time, the foal was standing beside the stallion. It belongs to me. Does my stallion's foal. Who has ever heard of a stallion having a foal? It was born to my mare. No, it was standing next to the stallion, so... It's the stallion's foal. The brothers started to quarrel. Then they decided to go before the emperor himself. They told him all about the dispute. Of course, the emperor knew perfectly well who was the owner of the foal. He was on the point of proclaiming in favor of the poor brother. When suddenly Ivan developed an unfortunate twitch in his eye. The emperor was greatly annoyed by this and decided to punish Ivan for his disrespect. And since he loved posing riddles and solving them as well, he exclaimed, I can't judge which of you should have the foal, so it will be awarded to whichever of you solves the following riddles. What is the fastest thing in the world? What is the fattest? What is the softest? And what is the most precious? I command you to return to this palace in a week with your answers. Dimitri puzzled over the answers as soon as he left. When he reached home, remembered a woman to whom he had once lent a silver coin. That had been some time ago, and with the interest, the neighbor now owed him three coins. And since he had a reputation for being quick-witted, he decided to ask her advice in exchange for canceling the debt. The fastest thing in the world is my husband's horse. Nothing can beat it. The fattest is our pig. 
Such a huge beast has never been seen. The softest is the bedding I made, using my own goose's feathers. The most precious thing in the world is my nephew. I wouldn't exchange him for all the gold on earth. Dimitri was rather doubtful about the woman's answers being correct. On the other hand, he had to take some kind of solution back to the emperor. And he guessed that if he didn't, he would be punished. In the meantime, Ivan had gone back to the cottage where he lived with his daughter. Only 16 years old, the girl was often left alone. And as a result, was thoughtful and very clever for her age. Ivan knew he would never be able to find the answers by himself. The girl sat in silence for a moment, then firmly said, Tell the emperor that the fastest thing in the world is the cold north wind. The fattest is the soil in our fields, whose crops give life to men and animals alike. The softest thing is a child's cuddle, and the most precious is honesty. The day came when the two brothers were to return before the emperor. The emperor was curious to hear answers, but he roared with laughter at Dmitri's foolish answers. However, when it was Ivan's turn to speak, a frown spread over the emperor's face. Ivan's wise replies surprised him, especially the last one. The emperor knew perfectly well that he had been dishonest in his dealings with Ivan, but he could not bear to admit it in front of his counselors, so he angrily demanded, Who gave you these answers? Ivan told the emperor that it was his daughter. Then the emperor said, You shall be rewarded for having such a wise and clever daughter. You shall be awarded the foal that your brother claimed together with a hundred silver coins. But, but, you will come before me in another seven days and bring your daughter. Since she's so clever, she must appear before me, neither naked nor dressed, neither on foot nor on horseback, neither bearing gifts nor empty-handed. And if she does this, you will have your reward. If not, you will have your head chopped off. Ivan went home in despair, his eyes brimming with tears. But when he told his daughter what had happened, she calmly said, Tomorrow, go and catch a rabbit and a partridge. Both must be alive. You'll have the foal and the hundred silver coins. Leave it to me. Ivan did as his daughter said. He had no idea what the two creatures were for, but he trusted in his daughter's wisdom. On the given day, the palace was thronged with witnesses, waiting for Ivan and his daughter to arrive. At last, the girl appeared, draped in a fishing net, riding with hair and holding the partridge in her hand. She was neither naked nor dressed, on foot or horseback, scowling, the emperor told her. I said neither bearing gifts nor empty-handed. At these words, the little girl held out the partridge. The emperor stretched out his hand to grasp it, but the bird fluttered into the air. The third condition had been fulfilled. Despite himself, the emperor could not help admiring the girl who had so cleverly passed such a test. He said, <laughs> Is your father poor, and does he desperately need the foal? Oh, yes. We live on the hares he catches in the rivers and the fish he picks from the trees. Aha! So you're not as clever as you seem to be. Who ever heard of hares in the river and fish on the trees? And who ever heard of a stallion having a foal? At that, both emperor and court burst into laughter. Ivan was immediately given his hundred silver coins and the foal, and the emperor proclaimed, Only in my kingdom could such a wise girl be born. The End The Glowing Princess A long time ago, there lived a king who fell very ill because of an evil spell. According to the spell, there was only one thing that could save him, and that was the dirt from a rabbit hole that was at least ten years old. As you might guess, 
this was a tough spell to break. I shall go to the end of the world to find it. The prince set out into the forest to find a rabbit's hole. He rode along, but no rabbit could be seen, until suddenly one rabbit shot across his path. Rabbit entered a cave, and so did the prince, a cave that belonged to an evil giant. Now, who do we have here? A prince it is. How dare you enter my cave? I need the soil from a rabbit's hole. Please let me get that. My father's life depends on it, and then I'll be out of your way. Am I a fool to let you go? You're going nowhere. The giant put the prince into a cage. Let me go! Let me go, please! For two days, the prince stayed in the cage. He tried his best to get out, but he couldn't. He was sick with worry about his dear father. On the second night, the cage was suddenly opened. The prince winced at a strange light, and he saw a maiden, the most glowing lady there ever could have been in the entire world. I am the rabbit you followed the other day. The giant has enchanted me such that I become a rabbit by day and regain my true form of a princess at night. Quick! The giant is out! Run away before he comes back and takes this earth from a ten-year-old rabbit's hole for your father! Go now! Could you repeat that a little bit slower? Giant is out. You want me to run away uh -huh. before he comes back. Yes. And you want me to take some of your dirt. Right about now would be good, yeah. Are you ten? Yes. As a rabbit, are you ten? Yes. Okay, thanks. Uh-huh. Give me your dirt. There you go. Pile it on. A little bit more. Oh, and, uh, is there anything I can do to help you? Do you want to just stay here and be a rabbit, or...? No, I'm good. Yes, of course I'd like some help. Okay, what can I do to help you? Escape from here now, and then when your father is well, go out and wander into the world. You will find a way to help me. Now leave! Those are pretty vague directions, but, uh, I'm a good wanderer. Okay. See ya... somewhere. Bye! The prince did as he was told. He went into the palace and saved his father's life. And then, as the princess had said, he decided to wander around the world. Father, now that you're well, I got a neat story to tell you. Um, you know that dirt that I made you eat before you got well? I got that from a rabbit. Oh, uh, well, uh, not just any rabbit. This rabbit was actually a princess. Cursed to be a rabbit uh, sometimes during the day. Anyway, skip forward. I'm supposed to leave you and go wander aimlessly around the world until I find her. And uh, that's all she told me. But I'll figure it out from there. Love you, Dad. Glad you're well. There's some dirt in the fridge. My son, I understand. More or less. Thank you for the dirt. The rabbit princess saved my life. You have to go do whatever you need to do to help her. Got it. Okay. So, uh, thanks. Uh, also, I think I'm gonna do this as, like, a regular peasant man and see what trade I can learn while I go. I don't know how long this wandering thing is gonna take. I might as well get some sort of occupational education. Very well. All the best, son. Good luck. So the prince left the palace as an ordinary youth. He wandered far when one night he met a fisherman at an inn. Hey, young man, I haven't seen you around here before. Are you new? Yes, I'm uh, looking to learn how to trade. I mean, learn a trade. I'm learning to... I would like to learn your trade. Then why don't you follow me? I could use some help with some strong hands like yours. Care to become a fisherman? Yes. So the prince went with the fisherman and learned the trade of fishing. After a few days, when work was over, the fisherman said, This net was given to me by a wizard. No one could escape from this net. 
take it with you as payment. Thank you so much. And so, the prince moved on. When he was hungry, he fished. When he needed money, he sold fish. And he reached a new kingdom, the palace of which shone with a thousand bright lights at night. He asked someone passing by about it. My man, I'm new here. Please tell me, why is this palace decorated? Oh, the palace is decorated every night. The king as a proud father celebrates the beauty of our princess, and the king challenges the lady who glows more than his daughter. Ah, uh, why such an emphasis on beauty? It's just the pride of a father. Oh, okay. The prince went to the king's court. Your Highness, I know of a maiden like glowing... Uh, sunny things. Uh, I know, I, I, I saw a girl, she looks, she's br um, pretty and bright. She's like the sunlight of the sun itself. I'm sorry, I really didn't think this through before I came. Your Highness, I know of a maiden as glowing like the sun itself. Fisherman, I give you a week, bring her here. <laughs> yes, very well. So the prince went back to the forest and found his way to the giant's cave. He entered the cave. They had a huge fight. He captured him in his net, and the giant was imprisoned. The prince held the princess, and both came out of the cave. The prince told the princess all about the king and his daughter. So now that I've rescued you, we need to go on this mission to help out this other princess. She's tired of her dad bragging on and on about her beauty. The whole palace is decorated. You gotta come see it. What do you say? Okay, yes, I understand. Sounds good. Let's do it. Road trip! All right, so how do we get the enchantment, the giant's spell curse thingy on you about the rabbit stuff to be broken forever? We gotta get that taken care of. Yeah, sure. So it can be broken if I walk through a mist of gold. As a woman or as a rabbit? Hmm, I don't know. We'll just have to try both. How much time do you have? So they traveled to the kingdom. Where is the maid that you said is more beautiful than my daughter? Your Highness, to reveal her, I need a good amount of gold mist from your treasury. Do you have, like, one of those little misty bottles? The king was very desperate to see the glowing princess. So he ordered, Get him a bowl of gold dust. Uh, the dust must be put into pipes to be blown into the air so it rises like a golden mist. It's part of the presentation of the most beautiful princess in the world. Your Highness, he's wasting our time and your gold dust. If he's wasting our time, he shall pay for it. So the gold dust was filled into pipes, and guards blew it so that the dust rose like a thick golden mist. Then the princess arrived. She walked out from the golden mist. Her enchantment was finally broken, and the entire court sat mesmerized by her immense beauty. My lady, you are indeed the most glowing woman in the world. See, Father, now please, stop bragging about my beauty to everyone. I am sorry, my dear. The prince told the king everything. The king arranged for them to go back to the prince's kingdom, where they were married and lived happily ever after. The giant never bothered them again, but they were careful to never venture near his cave. The End Diamonds and Toads Once upon a time, and a long time ago, there lived a woman with two daughters, Claire, the younger, who was as beautiful as she was good. Her eyes were warm as sunshine, her voice was full of bells, and she was as beautiful as gold. Melina, the older, was ugly and mean like her mother. Her mouth was bitter, her face was hard, and her heart was rusty as old nails. Melina and her mother hated Claire. They made her work all the time. She had to scrub their stockings and press their petticoats. They made her sit alone in the kitchen 
with nothing to eat but the scraps from their plates. Every morning and evening, Claire had to fetch water from the well. She had a long climb up a steep, rocky hill. The heavy buckets hurt her hands. But she took each step with a happy heart and merry soul. One morning, a ragged old woman hobbled up to the well and asked Claire for a drink. Now, truth be told, this old woman was a fairy. She had made herself look old and poor to see if Claire's heart was as kind as her face. Let me help you. Claire drew the clearest water from the coolest part of the well. She gave it to the ragged woman with a smile and a curtsy that made Claire's old tin cup seem as fine as silver. Thank you, my dear. You are as polite as you are pretty. And here is my gift of thanks to you. Each time you speak, flowers and jewels shall fall from your mouth. Then she disappeared before Claire could even thank her. Claire ran home with her heavy buckets, laughing as water and jewels splashed and sparkled all around her in the sun. As soon as she got home, her mother scolded her. You're late. I'm sorry, mother. Let me tell you what happened. Two roses, three diamonds, four pearls, and a ruby fell from her lips as she spoke. Then her wicked mother asked, suddenly acting sweet as sugar. Dear daughter, what can this mean? Jewels and flowers scattered on the floor as Claire told her story. The mother fell to her knees and shoved the jewels into her pockets, then yelled at Melina. Go to the well at once, and if you meet a ragged old woman, be sure to give her some water. Why should I? Just look at what your sister got. Diamonds and rubies, emeralds and pearls. Now, do as I say the greedy woman ordered her daughter. Melina fussed and snapped. She whined and whimpered. But she finally set off for the well, dragging her feet and carrying the best silver pitcher. She climbed the rocky hill, complaining every step of the way. When Melina finally reached the well, she met a lady dressed as a princess. May I have a drink? Melina was so hot and thirsty, she did not even answer. She dipped her pitcher into the well and took a long drink of cool water. Please help me. I am so very thirsty. If you want a drink, get it yourself. I'm not your servant. Shame on you. Your manners are as mean as your face. So, here is my gift for you. With each word you speak, Toads and snakes will fall from your mouth. Melina screamed and ran home, snakes and toads tumbling out of her mouth. Mama! Mama, just look at what happened! Her mother watched with horror as toads and snakes came pouring from Melina's mouth. It's all Claire's fault! Melina shrieked as toads hopped on her shoulders and snakes dripped from her hair. Then the mother scolds Claire. You made this happen. And she slapped Claire. Two tears, as bright as diamonds, slid down Claire's cheeks. Then Claire ran away, deep into the forest where the sun glittered on the leaves and the birds sang like flutes. She ran as far and as fast as she could, knowing she would never go home again. Soon, she heard the drum of hoofbeats. It was the king's son, following the trail of flowers that sprang up each time Claire took a step. Why are you crying? Claire told him her story. By the time she was done, the prince was in love with her kind heart and gentle ways. 
he hardly even saw the heaps of jewels sparkling at his feet. And now, the whole world lies before me. I will never go home again. I would be honored to welcome you into my home. They filled their hands with flowers, then set off for his castle. Everyone in the kingdom came out to welcome them. Claire and the prince decided to marry that very day. The fairy was the very first to give them her blessing. When the wicked mother heard of all this, she grew sick with envy. Melina grew meaner than ever. She shrieked and she hissed and howled till every room in the house swarmed with snakes and toads. Even her mother grew sick of her. At last, she chased Melina into the dark corner of the forest, where they both lived in great misery till they died of rage. Claire and the prince lived a long life, blessed with joy and plenty. And they always remembered the fairy's blessing. Of all great riches to have and hold, a kind heart is far more precious than gold. The End The Musician Once upon a time, there was a very talented young musician named Augusto, who lived in Italy. To become a master at playing his fiddle, he leaves his home in the village and makes his new home in a forest and among the trees. And in a very short amount of time, he reached his goal of becoming a master of the fiddle from playing to the tunes of the whistle in the trees and the waves of bending meadow grasses. Now he wishes to prove himself in front of an audience, so he thought of all manner of things, and when nothing was left for him to think about, he said to himself, This is taking far too long. I will seek out a good companion for myself, and to him I can show off my music also. Then he took his fiddle, which he always carried with him, and played so that it echoed through the forest. It was not long before a wolf came trotting through the thicket towards him. Ah, a wolf. Help! But the wolf came nearer and said to him, Oh, dear musician, how beautifully you play. I should like to learn that, too. It is easily learned... All you must do is anything I tell you to do. Oh, musician, I will obey you as a student obeys his teacher. The musician asked the wolf to follow, and when they had gone part of the way together, they came to an old oak tree, which was hollow inside and broken in the middle. Look, if you want to learn to fiddle, put your paws into this crevice. The wolf obeyed, but the musician quickly picked up a stone and with one blow wedged his two paws so fast that he was forced to stay there like a prisoner. Stay there until I come back again, said the musician and went his way. After a while, he again said to himself, Ah, oh, things are taking too long here in the forest. I will find another companion and he took to his fiddle again and played in the forest. It was not long before a fox came creeping through the trees towards him. Ah, a fox is coming! Oh dear, help! The fox came up to him and said, Oh, dear musician, how beautifully you do play! 
I should like to learn that too. That is quickly learned. Uh, all you have to do is everything I command you, said the musician. Oh, musician, I will obey you as a dog obeys his owner. Hmm, then follow me. And when they had walked part of the way, they came to a footpath with high bushes on both sides of it. There, the musician stood still, and from one side bent a young hazel bush down to the ground and put his foot on the top of it. Then he bent down a young tree from the other side as well and said, Now, little fox, if you want to learn something, give me your left front paw. The fox obeyed, and the musician fastened his paw to the left bush. Little fox, now give me your right paw. And he tied it to the right bush. Then he had examined whether they were firm enough. He let go, and the bushes sprang up again and jerked up the little fox so that it hung, struggling in the air. Wait there till I come back again, said the musician, and went his way. Again he said to himself, Ah, everything is taking forever for me here in the forest. I shall seek out another companion. So he took his fiddle, and the sound echoed through the forest. Then a little rabbit came springing towards him. Oh, no! A rabbit is coming! What good is a rabbit for a friend? I hope he goes away. Ah, dear musician, how beautifully you do play the fiddle. I, too, should like to learn that. Ah, that is quickly learned. Uh, all you have to do is everything I command you. Oh, musician, I will obey you as a student obeys his teacher. They went a part of the way together until they came to an open space in the forest where stood an aspen tree. The musician tied a long string round the little rabbit's neck, the other end of which he fastened to the tree. Now quickly, dear little rabbit, run twenty times round the tree, cried the musician, and the little rabbit obeyed. And when it had run around twenty times, it had twisted the string twenty times round the trunk of the tree, and the little rabbit was caught and let it pull and tug as it liked, it only made the string cut into its tender neck. Wait there until I come back, said the musician, and went onwards. The wolf, in the meantime, had pushed and pulled and bitten at the stone, and had worked so long that he had set himself free, and had drawn them once more out of the hollow tree. Full of anger and rage, he hurried after the musician, and he wanted to tear him to pieces. When the fox saw him running, he began to lament and cried with all his might. Brother wolf, come help me. The musician has betrayed me. The wolf drew down the little tree, bit the cord in two, and freed the fox, who went with him to take revenge on the musician. They found the tied-up rabbit, whom likewise they delivered, and then they all sought the enemy together. The musician had once more played his fiddle as he went on his way, and this time he had been more fortunate. The sound reached the ears of a poor woodcutter, who instantly was mesmerized by the enchanting music, gave up his work, and came with his hatchet under his arm to listen to the music. At last comes the right companion, for I was seeking a human being and no wild beast. And he began, and played so beautifully and delightfully, that the poor man stood there as if bewitched, and his heart leaped with gladness. And as he thus stood, the wolf, the fox, and the rabbit came up, and he saw well that they had some evil plan. So he raised his gleaming axe and placed himself before the musician as if to say, Whoever wants to arm the musician will have to go through me first. Then the wild animals were terrified at the man's threat and ran back into the forest. The musician, however, played once more to the man out of gratitude and then continued on his way. The End
King Grizzly Beard. Once upon a time, in the faraway kingdom, a king named Michael had a daughter named Dinah, who was as beautiful as a flower. But she was very selfish and overconfident that no suitor was good enough for her. She mocked many princes as they came to marry her. Once, King Michael made a great feast and invited all eligible suitors. Then, they were presented before the king's daughter. But with each man she saw, she had some objection to make. One was too fat, another was too tall, the third was too short, the fourth was too pale. So she had something to say against everyone. But she taunted a good king who stood there and whose beard had grown weird. He has a beard like a grizzly bear. From that time, he got the name King Grizzly Beard. But the old king, when he saw that his daughter did nothing but mock the suitors and hated all the suitors who were gathered there, was very angry and swore that she must marry the first beggar that came to his doors. A few days afterward, a beggar came and sang beneath the windows. When the king heard him, he said, Let him come up. So the beggar came in, in his dirty, ragged clothes, and sang before the king and his daughter. And when he had ended, he asked for a small gift. The king said, Your song has pleased me so well that I will give you my daughter as a gift, as your wife. The king's daughter trembled. But the king said, I have taken an oath to give you the very first beggar, daughter, and I will keep it. The princess was speechless and had no choice but to marry the beggar. Then the king said, Now, my daughter, it is not proper for you as a beggar woman to stay any longer in my palace. You may just have to go away with your husband. The beggar led her out by the hand, and she was obligated to walk away on foot with him. When they came to a large forest, she asked, To whom does that beautiful forest belong? It belongs to King Grizzlybeard. If you had taken him, it would have been your forest. Ah, what an unlucky girl I am. Afterward, they came to a meadow. To whom does this beautiful meadow belong? It belongs to King Grizzlybeard. If you had taken him, it would have been your meadow. Ah, what an unlucky girl I am. Then... They came to a large town. To whom does this fine large town belong? It belongs to King Grizzlybeard. If you had taken him, it would have been your town. Oh, what an unlucky girl I am. At last, they came to a very little hut. Oh, goodness. To whom does this miserable, nasty hut belong? That is my house, where we will live together. She goes into the hut. Mm. Where are the servants? What servants? You are my wife now. Make my supper. I am quite tired. So, I'm your servant? Yes. But Dinah knew nothing about cooking, and the beggar had to cook himself supper. Then they went to bed, but he forced her to get up early in the morning. For a few days, they lived in this way, and finished all their supplies. Wife, we cannot go on any longer earning nothing. I will try to sell clay pots. You must sit in the marketplace and sell the pottery. If any of the people from my father's kingdom come to the market and see me sitting there selling, how will they mock me? But Beggar was in no mood to listen to her. The next day, she sat down at the corner of the marketplace, but suddenly, there came a drunken horseman, and he rode through the pots so that they were all broken into a thousand bits. She began to weep now. What to do? Oh, no! <laughs> she ran home and told Beggar of the misfortune. Don't cry now. I can see that you cannot do any work. So I have been to our king's palace and have asked whether they have a place for a kitchen maid. And they promised to hire you. In that way, you will get your food for nothing. 
Dinah was now a maid and did the dirtiest work. In both her pockets, she fastened a little jar in which she took home the leftovers. And each night, she brought that food home to her husband. At the wedding of the king's eldest son, the poor princess went to the king's courtroom and placed herself by the door to watch. But servants carried dishes full of delicious food past her. The servants had pity on her and threw a few pieces to her as they passed. These she put in her jars to take home. Then the king's son entered, and when he saw the beautiful woman standing by the door, he took her by the hand and would have danced with her, but she refused and shrank back with fear, for she saw that it was King Grizzlybeard, the suitor she had driven away with her cruel comments, but she could not resist. He took her into the dancing room. As they came to the center of the floor, the string in her pockets, which held the jars, broke. The jars fell, hit the floor, and food was scattered across the floor. She was very ashamed. She jumped to the door and would have run away. But on the stairs, the prince caught her and brought her back. He said to her kindly, do not be afraid. I am the beggar and the horseman. It was because of my love for you that I disguised myself. Sometimes without humbling, humility cannot be reached. Then she began to cry, then said, I am not worthy to be your wife. Be comforted. The evil days are past. Now we will celebrate our wedding. Then the maids came and put most marvelous clothing on her, and her father and his whole court wished happiness in her marriage with King Grizzlybeard. After that, they lived happily ever after. The End The Three Magical Wishes Once upon a time, in the city of Florence, there was a very handsome and intelligent little boy named Johnny, who had lost his mother when he was very young. After several years, his father got married once again, and now he was taken care of by his stepmother named Rubella. She was a cruel woman who desired to destroy Johnny and his father. I don't like this boy and his father, but first, I have to get rid of this young one. What can I do to get him to leave this house? I don't feed him, I don't treat him well, and he is still here. Meanwhile, Johnny was sitting at the table. Ah, uh, this bread is so hard. I have to go to the water fountain and soak it in some water so I can eat it. When he was at the water fountain, soaking the bread, an old man who looks dirty passed by. I am so hungry. Can you please give me a piece of your bread, little boy? Of course, sir. It's just that it's very hard and I don't have something better to give you. I don't mind. And the old man ate the bread. Thank you, son. You just did a good deed and you deserve a reward. You should know that I am not a beggar, as it seems. I am a very a very powerful wizard. <coughs> I will grant you three wishes. Johnny scratched his head and thought about what he wanted. Well, I've been thinking and I want these three things. First, that every time my stepmother looks at me, she must start laughing and laughing and laughing. Second, I want a ball that whenever I throw it, it will not stop bouncing. And uh, third, a magic flute that can make people dance. Your wishes have been granted. Here, you have your bouncing ball and your flute. Then the man disappeared and Johnny went home. He went straight to see his stepmother. Mother, I just finished eating my bread. Very. 
Oh my, I can't stop laughing. <laughs> and the more she looked at the boy, the more she laughed. Why are you laughing, mother? <laughs> what is so funny? <laughs> he then realized that the spell was working now. Ah, I will uh, go to my room now. See you tomorrow. <laughs> and as soon as the boy left the room, she stopped laughing. What is wrong with me? I couldn't stop laughing. And every time the boy came to see his stepmother, she would start laughing. She couldn't do anything. She couldn't cook, take care of the house, eat, and she couldn't even sleep. She could only laugh and laugh. There must be someone who can help me. I can't go on like this. She asked the doctors for help, but none could find a cure. The doctors gave me medicines, but they wouldn't help. I wonder who can help me. I know. I will go to the hill. People say that a magician lives there. They say that he is very wise. So the next day, she went looking for the magician. Hmm, you are under a spell. I think it was my stepson. He put a mysterious and magical spell on you. Let me talk to him. And the magician went to the water fountain, where he found the boy Johnny soaking his bread. Hello, young boy. Who are you? I am someone who is trying to help your stepmother. Tell me at once, what did you do to her? I didn't do anything. Who did you talk to these last few days? What have you been doing? Tell me. Uh, you ask too many questions, and I'm getting tired. Do you see this ball? Yes. Why? Then the boy threw the ball, and it started bouncing and bouncing. If you get the ball and make it stop, I will tell you what you want to know. The magician chased the ball throughout the field until he got lost along with the ball. Since the magician couldn't get the information, the stepmother decided to take Johnny to the king. What are the charges against this young boy? He's a wizard. How do you know? <laughs> well, every time I look at him, I can't stop laughing. Hmm, <laughs> I can see that. You can hardly talk. Anyway, I'm in a hurry. Boy, you have to go to jail. Very well, but before going to jail, I would like to play my flute. Play it as long as you want. As soon as Johnny started playing the flute, his stepmother, the courtiers, the king, and everybody at the court started dancing and jumping, as if they had springs attached to their feet. I am exhausted! I can't go on like this. Mercy, mercy, please have mercy. King, if you promise me that I will be free and that you will keep me away from my stepmother, I will stop playing the flute. I promise, I promise. The boy stopped playing the flute, and suddenly, everybody stopped dancing. As for your stepmother, she will have to move to the farthest town away from you, and she will never return to this town, or bother you, ever, again. Oh, thank you. And after that, little Johnny lived happily ever after, in peace. The End The Magical Wishing Pond Once upon a time, there was a little princess named Jasmine. She was her father's only child, and she was spoiled. She was very stubborn and very selfish. 
She was always hungry for delicious food. One day, a magician visited the king to give him blessings and to warn him about a magical wishing pond within his dynasty. O oh, king, I came here to give you an ominous warning. Ooh, about a wishing pond in your state, which is... At the same time, little Jasmine was passing by the courtroom and she saw the magician talking to her father. She got excited when she heard about the magical wishing pond. As soon as she heard about a magical wishing pond, she ran to her room without staying to listen to the magician's full sentence. I must go to the magical wishing pond to ask for delicious food. The next day morning, Jasmine hurriedly got ready and started her journey towards the pond. At noon, she reached it with few gold coins in her pocket. She wanted to wish for many things, like a delicious cake, ice cream, hamburger, pizza, crispy turkey, chocolates, cookies, and many more. But when she read the warning sign at the pond, she was disappointed. It said, one wish per person. Magic pond, magic pond, give me a wish. Grant me a food pot, which will give me a treat. Suddenly, a magical pot came up from the pond, following a whisper. Here is your wish. What you ask for, follow my instructions, or it will work not. You have to say three magical words. Ting, tong, twang. Then the magical pot will begin making delicious food. It will fulfill your hungriest desires. But do not forget to say stop, pot, stop, or else it will make food non-stop. Okay, whatever. Jasmine came back to her palace. She was very curious about the magical pot and mumbled the magical words. Ting tong twain, I want chocolate cake and cocoa pudding. Magically, the pot started making a fountain of chocolate pudding and cake. Jasmine dove in and ate as though she were starving. Days and days passed as she asked for her every kind of food she could think of. She started to gain lots of weight. One day, King visited her. He saw a fat kid eating a chicken leg, and he came near. He didn't realize it was his daughter until he came closer. He was surprised and said, Oh, my, my dear princess, what have you done to yourself? Father, I visited a magical wishing pond a few days earlier and asked for a magic food pot. Now, for the last few days, I've been making wishes for food, and last night, I forgot the magical words to stop the pot. The king realized how selfish and greedy she was, and he held the crying princess in his arms and said, Dear princess, you never listen to anyone. I know you heard that magician talk about the magical wishing pond, but you must not have listened to everything he said. Oh, king, I came here to give you an ominous warning. Ooh, a wishing pond in your state, which grants wishes, but those wishes always come with a consequence. It is an evil magical pond. I suggest you destroy it as soon as possible. Now you know, my dear princess, why this is happening. Then the king summoned his guards and ordered, Pick up that pot and burn it in the fire. Immediately, guards followed the instructions and they put the pot in the burning stove and watched till it melted and turned to ashes. Afterward, the princess started to do daily exercise and soon she came into her original shape. After that, they lived happily forever. Moral of the story, never act on half-heard stories. The End
The Tale of Tom Thumb Once, there was a very old beggar who was wandering through the densely wooded forest. One day, when his feet were very sore, he knocked on the door of a one-eyed orc named Gogo and begged for a bite to eat. The orc Gogo and his wife Gigi welcomed the stranger into their cave. While his wife put some bread on a small plate, they realized that their guest was none other than Merlin, the greatest and most skillful wizard of all the realms. Oh, great Merlin, please accept our humble assistance. You both are very humble and generous. I am well pleased. Therefore, I wish to offer you anything you desire. He snapped his fingers twice, and then bubbles appeared above his head with images in them. Ah, the skadoosh! Shiny heaps of gold, sparkling diamond mines. Tell me, what do you wish for? Oh, I should be the happiest creature in the world if I had a son. Even if he was no bigger than my husband's thumb, I would be satisfied. Gigi gazed at her thumb in wistful longing. Merlin was so amused with the idea of an orc boy, no bigger than a thumb, that he decided to grant the poor woman's wish. And poof, there came a sweet little orc boy holding Gigi's thumb. The new orc parents felt utter happiness, and they thanked Merlin countless times. Soon after, the wizard departed from his humble host's dwelling. Tom never grew any larger than his father's thumb. That's why everyone called him Tom Thumb. Gogo and Gigi never let their very tiny son disappear from their sight for fear of losing him. They crafted a small toy house for him to live in. And as he got older, he became a very cunning and clever lad. One day, Gogo was getting ready to go into the forest to cut wood. He said to himself, I wish I had someone to drive the cart to me. Father, I can bring the cart all by myself. Gogo laughed and he answered, <laughs> Well, let's at least try. When the time came, Tom asked his mother to harness the horse to the cart. And then he sat in the horse's ear and gave him directions. So the horse went the correct way through the densely wooded forest. It happened that as they turned a corner, Tom was calling out, Gently, gently. Two humans responded to his cry of distress. One of them saw the horse and heard the voice, but couldn't see the rider. What an odd thing that is. There goes a cart, and the rider is talking to the horse. But still, the rider is not to be seen. They started to follow the cart out of curiosity, wondering what sort of strange magic this was. The cart drove directly into the forest, and exactly to the place where Gogo was working. Then Tom, seeing his father, called out to him. Do you see, Dad? I have arrived with the cart. Gogo took his son and put the boy onto his shoulder. The two strangers were looking upward all this time and did not know what to say as they were simply flabbergasted. Then one of them rattled the other by the shoulders, saying with greedy excitement, We must steal the little orc. He would make our fortune. People from all over would pay to see a little freak like him. We'd be rich, rich, I tell you. So they hastily disguised themselves by covering with branches and leaves. When Gogo was taking a shortcut through the woods, they gingerly grabbed Tom by putting a hand over his tiny mouth and swiftly stuffing him inside their satchel. And just like that, they slipped away 
cloaked in the shadows of the tall pines of the forest. Help, Dad! Help me! Tom was shouting, but no one could hear him. The two strange kidnappers journeyed onward till dusk had begun to fall, and Tom requested with urgency in his voice, Will, will, will you please set me down? I need to go to the bathroom! Don't you fool us, piggy boy. We know you just want to escape and run away, right? No, sir. But if you doubt me, then I suggest you tie me with a thread. They agreed to bind the boy in a thread. With one end tied to Tom and the other tied to the human's hand, they released him and allowed him to relieve himself. Tom nimbly slipped into a mouse hole and cut the thread with his strong teeth. The men stuck their sticks into the hole, but it was all in vain because Tom crept still farther into the hole. As it became darker and darker, they were forced to give up in frustration. After a while, when Tom realized that his kidnappers were gone, he crept out of the hole. As he was walking, he heard two goblins chatting together about how to rob his father, Gogo. He then came out from the shell and disrupted their scheming with cunning cleverness. I could tell you how. I can slip through the door of the cave, then into the safe, and I can get you as much gold as you want. What do you say? <laughs> and why would you help us out like that? Hmm, what's in it for you, you little thing? I would get my fair share of the loot, of course. <laughs> yeah, why not? Let's go then. Goblin carries Tom atop his head, and off they went. As they approached Gogo's cave, Tom slipped through a tiny little crack in the cave and opened the door for them by pulling a small lever that his father had specially made for Tom. The two goblins entered the cave, their eyes gleaming with the glitter of greediness. They double-checked to make sure that the orc couple were sleeping and proceeded to stealthily traverse to the treasury room. As the goblins began to selfishly stuff gold into their satchel, Tom closed the treasure room door by pulling yet another lever, trapping them inside. He called out, Dad! Dad, come here! I have captured robbers! Both Gogo and Gigi wake up, with a smile dancing across their faces as they hear their son and run towards the sound of his sweet voice. My little Tom has returned! The whole family cried tears of gratitude and joy at the reunion of their family, as well as the safety of their belongings. Gigi then picked up her son Tom and kissed him. Soon, they heard the whispering of the two would-have-been thieving goblins from the treasure room. <laughs> hey, tomboy, come on, open the door. Your share of the treasure is here, just waiting for you. Um, Tom, you there? Can you hear me now? The whole orc family laughed at their intruder's predicament. And then, Gogo went to teach them a lesson and beat them good and hard. Soon, Tom could hear the goblins crying for mercy and in fear of their lives. When Gogo finally emerged from out of the treasury room, two goblins were swinging upside down in his tightly fisted grasp. And Tom felt so very proud to be the son of such awe-inspiring parents. From now on, we will treat you as the orc treat another. I am proud of you, my son. The End The Almighty's Conditions Thousands of years ago, a mighty god lived among all the living creatures. He had not yet created humans. The rabbit was the most talented creature 
at that time. One day, Rabbit visited the god at his palace, which is also in the jungle. It is a pleasure having you in my palace. What can I do for you? Almighty deity, you have control over everybody and everything in this forest. You are a true master. I need a favor. What kind of favor? Just one thing. Please make me wise and intelligent. Well, well, well. Everyone wants to be rich, and you're asking me to make you smarter. Why? Because I want to be more intelligent than all the animals in the forest. Hmm, fine. But you'll have to show me what you're capable of. Because I was thinking of making a separate species and granting them wiseness and intelligence. If you prove to me that you're capable, then I will cancel my plans for the creation of humans. What do you think, hmm? I'll do whatever is necessary. If you can get me five blue birds, five white butterflies, a bee as big as you, then I'll see what I can do for you. <laughs> I'll get them. I won't fail. In the forest, Rabbit enters looking tired. He sits on the floor beside a pond. All kinds of animals enter and start drinking water from the pond. Then they leave. Five bluebirds enter and drink water from the pond. Then they start playing and jumping. <laughs> Today I'll know what I'm capable of. No, it can't be. It's not possible. That's not true. I cannot believe it. No, they are not that many. The five bluebirds approach him. Hey, Rabbit, what are you talking about? What's the matter? It's nothing. It's just impossible. Please, tell us what's wrong. Oh, someone told me that you could come with me, but I know that is impossible. You would get tired of the trip. <laughs> are you kidding? We never get tired. We always fly long distances. Flying doesn't make us feel tired. We can go with you wherever you go. The five bluebirds laugh and dance around the rabbit. Great! <laughs> five white butterflies enter and start drinking honey from flowers by the pond. Wow, those are the most beautiful butterflies I have ever seen. <laughs> but. But no, I don't think they can do that. That would be impossible. <laughs> what am I thinking? The five white butterflies approach him. Hey, Rabbit. What are you talking about? What's the matter? Oh, it's nothing. It's just impossible. Please, tell us what's wrong. Uh, well, someone told me that you could come with me, but I know that's just impossible. You would get tired of the trip. <laughs> Are you kidding? You're not serious, right? We never get tired. We always fly long distances. Flying doesn't make us feel tired. We can go with you wherever you go. The five white butterflies Laugh and dance around the rabbit. <laughs> Great! A big bee enters and drinks honey from a flower. What a beautiful bee! But no, I don't think she can do it. That would be impossible. <laughs> I must be crazy. The bee approaches him. Hey, rabbit! What are you talking about? What's the matter? It's nothing. It's just impossible. Please, tell me what's wrong. <laughs> Someone told me that you could come with me, but I know that is impossible. You would get tired of the trip. <laughs> are you kidding? No, you, you couldn't. I never get tired. I always travel long distances. <laughs> Perfect. Let's go, everybody. 
Yeah. 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 Hey, wait. You haven't told us where we're going. That's a big surprise. <laughs> Is it good or bad? No, oh, good, of course. Come on, before it gets dark. At the God's Palace, the rabbit, five bluebirds, five white butterflies, and the huge bee stand before the God. I was waiting for you. The God was looking at the five birds, five butterflies, and the bee. I see you brought to the company. Will you grant my wish now? I don't think so. Why not? If I make you more intelligent, I would be making a big mistake. How come? Because you are already very intelligent. Then, am I more intelligent than the other animals in the forest? You've always been smart, but you didn't know it. What is your wish? They all start talking at the same time. Rabbit leaves the palace, walking out triumphantly. The End